So first a little IBD 101, as the name of this course is uh, given. Um, so for ulcerative colitis, it's typically confined at the colon, begins in the rectum, extends proximally in a continuous fashion. Uh, it's, it's confined to the mucosa and submucosa. It's truly a, su a mucosal disease. Um, pathologically, it's typified by cryptitis and crypt abscesses. Uh, there's also lamina propria expansion, as well as crypt architectural distortion. Here on the left, you see a classical uh, example of a crypt abscess, and here you have on the right, marked expansion of the lamina propria, as well as crypt architectural distortion. <clears throat> Endoscopically, endosco endoscopy does a really nice job of defining disease extent and severity and uh, predicting complications in IBD. Um, when you see on the left, uh, top left, you have mild disease with some erythema, edema, some hypovascularity. Here you have some friability and some erosions with moderate disease and with severe disease, some superficial ulceration, some exudate, and some uh, uh, spontaneous bleeding. And Crohn's can involve any segment of the GI tract from mouth to anus. It can spare the rectum. Uh, it can be discontinuous. It tends to involve the anus in a large percentage of cases with skin tags, fissures, or fistulae. Uh, one of the hallmark features is transmural uh, in inflammation with complications of stricture, perforation, fistula, abscess, which we're all familiar with. Uh, pathologically, you see epithelioid, non caseating granulomas, as well as chronic inflammatory infiltrate and crypt architectural distortion. This is a typical Crohn's granuloma, it's epithelioid and non caseating. Endoscopically, you can have some mild features of patchy erythema, some aphthous ulceration, more moderate stuff with some linear ulceration, and then severe inflammation with deep fissuring, penetrating ulcers, and even fistulae. <clears throat> so, when thinking about this topic, I was reflecting back on my past several years of patients who have been referred for second and third opinions. And what I found, aside from um, being referred for refractory disease, was that patients were actually most commonly, uh, the, the other thing I saw is that they were sometimes misdiagnosed as having UC versus Crohn's or vice versa. And also there's been a misuse and an overuse of the term IBDU, IBD unclassified or indeterminate colitis. Um, what I haven't seen, however, is a misclassification of disease extent or severity. So because we have limited time here, I thought it'd be most useful if we really focus on defining the disease. Uh, Maria pointed out the genetic study from Nature in 2012, which Judy Cho led, showing that there's a lot of overlap between the diseases. But in what I see, I have a lot of patients who end up going to colectomy, and it really does make a big difference if you have the diagnosis correct, because if, if not, it can be disastrous later. So I'd like to first start off with, does discontinuous disease mean that you have Crohn's? We'll talk about rectal sparing, which can be relative in which the rectum is less involved, or absolute, in which there's no inflammation, general patchiness, and the, specifically the periappendiceal or sequel patch. <clears throat> so first with rectal sparing. Well, it turns out in untreated UC, you can get rectal sparing in a variety of situations. One of the most common is in pediatric patients. So pediatric patients tend to have more pancolitis but they also tend to have more rectal sparing and general patchiness. Also in PSC, you may uh, potentially see more rectal sparing than you do in UC without PSC. In fulminant colitis, uh, before it's been treated, you can see rectal sparing, but it tends to be much more often relative as opposed to absolute. And occasionally adults can exhibit rectal sparing. As far as general patchiness goes, uh, the most common situation in which we see general patchiness in untreated UC is in pediatric patients. However, with treated UC, it turns out that rectal sparing and general patchiness are fairly common, occurring as often uh, for rectal sparing endoscopically as 47% or histologically 36%, or general patchiness occurring as often endoscopically in 59% or 54% in this one series. How about the periappendiceal, or less commonly sequel patch, or even less commonly <clears throat> ascending colon patch? So in colectomy studies, it's, there's a sort of wide range of frequencies reported, typically around the 30% range. In prospective endoscopic studies, it's seen anywhere between one quarter and three quarters of patients. And some other interesting findings are that you can see 
it, both in uh, appearing in untreated disease as well as treated disease, and your status of having a periappendiceal uh, patch can change. In some patients, when they had it, they could become negative, and those that didn't have it initially can become positive over time. And there's conflicting prognostic data as, a, as far as what, what does this mean. <clears throat> so now we'll talk about ileitis. Does having ileitis mean that you have Crohn's disease? And specifically what I'm going to do is I'm going to define backwash, ileitis, and ulcerative colitis. And it's still unclear whether this is truly a backwash or its primary ileal involvement. But the way it's defined is that no more than 5 to 10 centimeters of ileal involvement. Beyond that, it's either IBDU or Crohn's disease. What you see endoscopically is some erythema and edema, maybe some superficial ulceration. Of note, the IC valve should be without ulceration or stenosis, in which case you're thinking Crohn's disease. <clears throat> Pathologically, you'll see some mild patchy neutrophilic inflammation, but of note, an absence of granulomas, transmural lymphoid aggregates, or fish ring ulcers. And on radiographic studies, uh, a backwash ileitis will appear smooth and tubular. As far as how frequent does this happen, these are colectomy series, um, showing that it happens anywhere between 9 and 18 percent of patients overall, a little bit higher potentially in patients with pancolitis. Um, in, in the largest series here from the Cleveland Clinic, 1,400 patients or more, it was seen in 9 percent of patients with UC or indeterminate colitis. Also, you might see backwash ileitis more commonly in patients with PSC. How about granulomas? Does, Having granulomas mean that you have Crohn's disease. Well, it turns out not necessarily. You can see granulomas and ulcerative colitis in very specific situations, particularly associated with ruptured crypts, ulcer beds, or extravasated mucin. And the inflammatory cells that you see in ulcerative colitis granulomas differ from those in Crohn's. In ulcerative colitis, <clears throat> they include neutrophils, lymphocytes, multinucleated giant cells, foamy macrophages, sort of an admixture of various types of cells. In Crohn's disease, where granul granulomas occur with various frequencies depending on which studies you see, one of the two pathological hallmark features of Crohn's disease is the epithelioid granuloma. And this is designed, uh, defined very specifically as a well-formed, discrete collection of five or more activated histiocytes with homogeneous eosinophilic cytoplasm, i.e. epithelioid cells, with or without multinucleated giant cells, and ideally <clears throat> located in the submucosa. Of note, these are non-caseating, there's no foreign body reaction, which can also give you granulomas, and they're not associated with a ruptured crypt or ulcer. So what this looks like under the microscope, on the left, this is a, actually a granuloma and ulcerative colitis associated with a ruptured crypt in which you see this admixture of various inflammatory cells. On the right, this is our t classical uh, Crohn's granuloma with uh, his activated histiocytes and some multinucleated giant cells. So does transmural inflammation, does that mean that you have Crohn's disease? Well, <clears throat> actually, not exactly. In patients with fulminant ulcerative colitis, you can have these f deeper fissuring ulcers which extend more than 50% of the surface and leading to some transmural lymphoid aggregates under these areas of severe ulceration. And even in toxic megacolon, you may even see uh, cirrhosal inflammation. The other pathological hallmark feature of Crohn's disease is transmural lymphoid aggregates under intact mucosa. So if you see these under the mu in intact mucosa, it's by definition Crohn's disease. If you see it under an area of severe ulceration, it still may be fulminant ulcerative colitis. How about the corollary? So does superficial ulceration mean that you have ulcerative colitis? Well, it turns out Crohn's disease of the colon is less often associated with transmural lymphoid aggregates or transmural complications than Crohn's disease in other parts of the GI tract. <clears throat> Crohn's colitis can also be superficial and continuous, just like you see. And in non-granulomatous Crohn's colitis, it can have a milder course and very closely mimic UC. So how about aphthous ulcers? We see these commonly in patients. Um, does it mean you have Crohn's disease? Well, uh, there's a paucity of data in ulcerative colitis, but in one series from the Brigham, they were found in 17% of specimens. So having aphthous ulcers does not a diagnosis of Crohn's make. So now we're going to move outside of the colon to other parts of the GI tract. So does having gastritis mean that you also have Crohn's disease? Before I delve into this further, I just wanted to say that the European and the North American Pediatric GI Societies recommend an upper endoscopy with biopsy as part of the routine workup of any patient suspected of having IBD. And you might ask, why is that? Well, it's because you can find upper GI granulomas in uh, up to a quarter of patients with IBD, thus making the diagnosis of Crohn's disease. 
<clears throat> now, no discussion of gastritis can occur without discussing H. pylori. And as it turns out in meta-analysis, it's less common in IVD patients as opposed to uh, people without IVD. Conversely, <clears throat> H. pylori negative gastritis is rare in the general population. So interestingly enough, endoscopic and histological changes of gastritis are both very common in ulcerative colitis and in Crohn's. Ulcerative colitis where it can occur in up to two-thirds of patients, and Crohn's where it can occur in up to three-fourths, and they can have the same exact findings of erythema, edema, erosions, aphthous ulcers, nodularity, and polyps. Histologically, you can see acute and or chronic inflammation, which can be diffuse or focal, with crypt abscesses, lymphoid aggregates, or ulceration. So, Having gastritis does not reliably differentiate ulcerative colitis from Crohn's disease. There's a recent, more recently recognized entity called focally enhanced gastritis, which is classically a microscopic lesion, which is defined as having one or more foveola surrounded by essentially mostly chronic inflammatory cells in a background of normal. And what this looks like on the left, this is a high power view, as low power view with a lymphocyte stain showing the focality of the lesion. And on the right, <clears throat> this is a view showing high power of these chronic inflammatory infiltrates. And in the three largest series that have examined this, they've shown that although more common in patients with Crohn's than in ulcerative colitis, they do occur in potentially up to 25% of patients with ulcerative colitis, thus not being able to reliably differentiate one disease versus another. And it doesn't seem to be associated with prognostication. <clears throat> How about duodenitis? Does that mean you have Crohn's disease? Well, it turns out while not quite as common as uh, gastritis for both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, it can be seen in a fair number of patients with both, and they can have the same uh, both endoscopic and histological features, so it doesn't reliably differentiate one disease from the other. How about enteritis? Does having enteritis mean that you have Crohn's disease? These are some video capsule endoscopy images. As you know, capsule endoscopy picks up a lot of different stuff. And as far as yield of capsule endoscopy and meta-analysis, it's been shown that the yield of a capsule endoscopy for suspected Crohn's may be higher than small bowel follow-through or CT enterography being comparable with MR enterography. But keep in mind the caveat of this study is that in many of these occasions, they define Crohn's disease as having as little as, as just uh, erosions on your capsule endoscopy. However, using a more rigorous gold standard consensus definition, which included ileocolonoscopy, you can see that the sensitivity of capsule endoscopy is not higher than that of small bowel follow through a CT enterography. However, the uh, specificity is markedly and significantly lower than either of those modalities. The reason being that even healthy patients can have abnormal and often do have abnormal uh, capsule endoscopies with some mucosal breaks, some ulcerations, mild ulcerations or erosions. Even patients who have isolated ileitis on ileocolonoscopy, if they're asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic, even though these changes very, very closely look like Crohn's disease, they might not actually even develop Crohn's disease. And one thing that we have to really keep in mind is NSAID use, which is very common and often undisclosed. But even with as little as two weeks of NSAID use, you can have marked changes on your capsule endoscopy. So when we use capsule endoscopy in Crohn's, we should, for suspected Crohn's, we really should be using it for suspected Crohn's disease, and we should have patients ask them about their NSAID use, stop it beforehand so we can have a cleaner study. <clears throat> How about anal fissures? Do having anal fissures mean that you have Crohn's disease? Unfortunately, there's a paucity of data in ulcerative colitis, but they're very common in the general population, in which they tend to be midline, single, and painful. However, in Crohn's disease, although posterior midline is still the most common location, they can be located in other areas, they may be multiple, and they're often painless unless they are also associated with an uh, ulcer, fistula, or abscess. In population-based studies, the prevalence of anal fissures in Crohn's is about 11%, and they're often associated with skin tags. And speaking of skin tags, on the left here, we have your type 1 skin tag, which tends to be hard, potentially cyanotic, and painful, um, and your type 2 skin tags, which are your sort of uh, non-painful elephant ear soft skin tags. So do skin, do having skin tags mean that you have Crohn's disease? Well, there's not that much data in ulcerative colitis, but on a study from Lenox Hill, the largest that we have focusing on uh, type 2 skin tags, they showed that a quarter of the patients with ulcerative colitis had anal skin tags. And as far as this type 1 hard cyanotic skin tag we often see in our Crohn's patients, keep in mind that they can also arise from healing of a hemorrhoid, and this thus be seen in the general population or in patients with ulcerative colitis. 
In population-based studies, um, <clears throat> their skin tags are seen in about 20% of patients with Crohn's. So take into account all these things we've just talked about, which can help you confirm or change your diagnosis that you originally made. When we really talk about inflammatory bowel disease unclassified, IBDU, it's really been defined as these, having one or more of these following very specific features. Um, this is based on the IBD working groups from both NASPGAN and CCFA, as well as IOIBD. So some of these features include absolute rectal sparing, which if you have an adult without PSC and without fulminant colitis with absolute rectal sparing, you really should be thinking about Crohn's disease. Backwash ileitis of more than 10 centimeters or aphthous ulcers in the ileum. Microscopic ileitis and left-sided UC, severe focal gastritis, anal fissures or skin tags, large oral aphthous ulcers, or growth failure. These are things that will make your diagnosis IBDU. And then the term indeterminate colitis should really be restricted to colectomy specimens in which it was first coined. Over time, what's happened is this term has grown into a large wastebasket term of different various definitions by GI physicians and by pathologists and has become essentially a useless term. So in the last just few minutes, I just want to talk about, are there any other things that you can find diagnostically to help you define if someone has Crohn's versus UC? <clears throat> and in this study from Cedars-Sinai of patients whose diagnosis changed from ulcerative colitis to Crohn's, they found that patients whose diagnosis changed were more likely to have pancolitis and were more likely to have non-bloody diarrhea or weight loss. In colectomy series of patients who di whose diagnosis changed either immediately after surgery or around three years after the surgery, predictors of immediate including have, uh, having a diagnosis of indeterminate colitis or having a perianal fistula. And in predictors of, delay, of a sort of a later diagnosis of Crohn's were a younger age, having mouth ulcers, having perianal fistula or fissure or a colon colorectal stricture. And finally, I want to wrap up with just a brief mention of serologies as they're, as they're ordered very commonly, but they can be quite confusing to interpret. Um, so this is a really nice review by Michael Cam's group from the UK at various serologies. And as you can see, while more common in patients with Crohn's disease except for Pianca, which is seen more commonly in UC, they can be seen in ulcerative colitis as well as other GI diseases as well as in healthy volunteers. So when looking at how, how can you use this test diagnostically, well, these tests alone are not sufficient given the low sensitivity to differentiate IBD from healthy, IBD from other GI diseases, Crohn's disease from ulcerative colitis, and although ASCA positive, P ANCA negative has the best overall combined sensitivity and specificity, it still is insufficient. And even differentiating <coughs> colonic Crohn's versus UC, again, very low sensitivities. So I generally don't order these tests, but if I have them on a patient, <clears throat> I'll use them just as an adjunct to combine with all my other clinical information to help make a diagnosis. The one avenue where I think that serologies are potentially useful are, are in predicting disease course in Crohn's disease, where in, this is a study from Marla Dubinsky looking at not only are these individual antibodies predictive of future in, internal penetrating, stricturing disease, or needing surgery, but the number of antibodies here, or the titers of the antibodies when added up, this QSS quartile sum score, was important in showing that the more of these things you have around, the more likely you are to have severe disease. And I'll end with that. Thank you.